Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Let's give you a quick preview of what we have in store for you today. First, we have a guest this evening on our live show at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. That's right. The guest is the one and only Lori Hellis, who went toe-to-toe with Judge Boyce. She will tell us about what the status is of her request to unseal those documents in the Lori Valachad Day Bell matter tonight at 6 p.m. Please join us. Next, newly released video from the Gabby Petito matter shows us how quickly life can change. Mythbusters helps set a man free. Why the Alec Murdoch case is going to be so interesting. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, aficionados. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Leave me a comment and hit that little bell for notifications. And remember, you can always listen to us on any of your favorite podcasting apps. Just simply type in Scott Reich, Crime Talk, and there you have it. All right, let's go ahead and get to the docket today for October 18th, 2022. First, newly released surveillance video shows Gabby Petito walking around a Whole Foods supermarket with her would-be killer, Brian Laundrie, just hours before he strangled her and dumped her body in the woods. Now, the video shows the couple uh, walking an aisle in the Jackson, Wyoming supermarket on August 27th, 2021, the day Miss Gabby Petito was last seen alive. It picks up shortly after a couple left the Mary Piglet's Tex-Mex restaurant nearby, following a public argument between Laundrie and three female staffers, which Petito ultimately apologized for. They could be seen parking Petito's white Ford Transit van in the parking lot around 2.11 p.m., sitting in the car for a minute, and then Laundrie gets out of the driver's side and slams the door. He then approaches the rear of the van, grabs a baseball cap from the back compartment. At this point, Petito steps into view from around the passenger side, apparently still upset at laundry over the scene that he caused at the restaurant earlier as she still has her arms crossed in front of her. Now, laundry has his hands in his pocket with his face hidden under the hat and obscured behind sunglasses. Now, footage from inside the supermarket shows the couple walking the aisle as they made their way through the store for about 15 minutes. Petito could be seen grabbing some items as she wandered the store and putting them into a white duffel bag. Once their shopping is complete, about 40 minutes later, the couple could be seen returning to their van and heading onto Highway 89, which leads directly to the Bridger Teton National Forest campsite where Gabby Petito's remains would be found three weeks later. It truly reminds us of how quickly life can change. Pick your friends very carefully. Pick your future lovers, spouses, girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever, very carefully. If they've got anger issues, be concerned. Be very, very concerned. Next, Mythbusters help release an innocent man from jail. An innocent man has been freed from prison after 35 years for his wrongful conviction, partially thanks to a rerun of an old Mythbusters episode. So back in September of 1986, two brothers were killed in a fire at an apartment in southwest Chicago. Two siblings managed to escape the fire and told authorities that they believed the fire had been started by a neighbor in retaliation for the death of her brother, allegedly at the hands of a street gang known as the Latin Kings. Now, this is all alleged by the Innocent Project. The neighbor was interviewed, but pointed to 18-year-old John Galvin, his brother, and a third neighbor. Other neighbors also accused the three and John, who had been asleep at his grandmother's house at the time of the fire, was arrested. Now, during his arrest, Galvin was interrogated and told he could go home if he implicated others in the crime, something that was also offered to another accused of the crime, Arthur Almendarez. Eventually, all three signed statements confessing to the crime, admitting to throwing a Molotov cocktail through a window of the apartment block. Now, John and Arthur later said that these statements were signed following physical abuse, while the third accused man said that he had signed it drunk 
and without having read his rights. All three were later convicted of first-degree murder and aggravated arson. One problem with Galvin's statement, which would eventually help to get his conviction overturned, was that it claimed that he had lit the Molotov cocktail with a cigarette. Now, years later, when Galvin was 39, he watched a rerun of an episode of Mythbusters from his prison cell and saw them prove that that was pretty much impossible. The show tested Hollywood's uh, belief, including that throwing a cigarette into a gasoline pool would ignite. After several desperate attempts to light a fire with a cigarette, even rolling it around in there, they concluded that it was a myth. In fact, though, we'd really recommend just rubbing it against the ground. It is possible to put a cigarette out in gasoline if you're in one hell of a pinch. Now, Gavin contacted his lawyer, who had also seen the episode by coincidence, and she investigated this aspect of his case further. It turned out that in 2007, a team of researchers at the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, affectionately known as the ATF, had looked into the same after a group of suspected arsonists claimed that cigarettes had accidentally started fires. The team tried 2,000 times to start a gasoline fire using a cigarette to light it, even spraying gasoline at a lit cigarette. Not once did it ignite. Despite what you see in action movies, dropping a lit cigarette onto a trail of gasoline won't ignite it, assuming normal oxygen levels and no unusual circumstances exist, the uh, Bureau stated in their report. That's because the gasoline has limited contact with the hottest glowing part of the ash, and x-ray thermography has shown that this is very localized. Using arson experts to attest to the impossibility of lighting gasoline using cigarettes, and several witnesses who testified that the police who uh, took the statements had used violent coercion elsewhere, Galvin legal team were able to secure his exoneration. A few years later, all three convictions were overturned at their own appeals. Now, Mr. Galvin's uh, case speaks to the critical importance of establishing such mechanisms for people to get back into court when science changes or evolves, or when experts repudiate past testimony. Without these mechanisms in place, many instances, innocent people are prevented from presenting forensic evidence of their innocence after their wrongful conviction. A change in science statute here would have allowed for a presentation reflecting those changes in arson science and could have likely expedited Mr. Galvin's exoneration. That story, ladies and gentlemen, shows you many, many problems with the legal system. First, police officers physically abusing people to get confessions. Wrong, right? We don't do that here in the United States. That is just wrong. Then we have the fact that there was junk science permitted. The prosecution went along with it. Their experts would have went along with it. And guess what? So did the court, and then the jury bought it as well. That's why you can't have this literally junk science in courtrooms, and it needs to be challenged. And that's what attorneys do. They challenge. They look at the assumptions that are being made, and they challenge those. And oftentimes, it cannot be backed up or repeated, which is what science you're supposed to be able to do. So interesting story. Too bad that Mr. Galvin had to spend 35 years in prison, but oh, well, hey, don't worry. We did our best. We tried. Next, the Alec Murdoch case. Now, this case is going to be interesting. Some people say, oh, Scott, I'm not interested. But let me tell you why it's going to be interesting. First, we have Alec Murdoch, a man that was born basically with a silver spoon in his mouth, could have taken over the alleged criminal empire from his grandfather and father but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. So we have this family, a complete fall from grace, two deaths alleging homicide, and maybe more deaths uh, are thrown into, like I said, this potential criminal enterprise that existed. We also have very good attorneys on both sides, and the defense is pushing because they know the state is not prepared. The government or the state always expects a continuance in a homicide trial. That didn't take place in this particular case. They said, let's go to trial. We have a trial date in early 
2023. Now, here's a list of items sought by the Murdoch attorneys that they're saying the prosecution hasn't turned over. First, they request any and all testing results of Paul and Maggie's clothing, including DNA, GSR, gunshot residue, and they state in uh, their request that the failure to conduct any DNA analysis of Paul and Maggie's clothing would be convincing evidence that the state's investigation has only been solely focused on Mr. Murdoch since the night of the murders. GSR testing lab results and bench notes providing the specific number of particles removed from Mr. Murdoch's shirt, shorts, and hands. And the amount of the gunshot residue found on Mr. Murdoch is consistent with transfer particles from a shotgun that he retrieved while he was waiting for emergency personnel to arrive at the scene. Mr. Murdoch has requested the specific laboratory analysis document, the specific particles found on his clothing and person, and this information is necessary so that the defense experts can assess whether the amount of GSR found on Mr. Murdoch's clothing is consistent with the state's theory that he shot his son Paul at a close range with a shotgun. Cell phone forensic analysis. The state intends to rely upon its analysis of various artifacts within Maggie and Paul's phones as evidence of time of death. However, the state has not produced any such analysis, and when questioned about the existence of such analysis, they indicate that no report has been issued. A government, the defense in Mr. Murdoch's case, is also saying, can we get a copy of the complete autopsy file? which would include the pathologist's handwritten notes, diagrams which are commonly made during the course of the autopsy, documents and information relating to the state's retained crime scene experts, and the defense seeks all crime scene expert reports, drafts which have not been produced, as well as any photographs and all emails between SLED, which is the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, and the state's retained crime experts. They are digging for everything that should have been turned over. They want from these reports any letters, notes, diagrams, photographs, computer reconstruction, demonstrative aids, or any such thing produced. Photos from Maggie's phone. All sled lab bench notes relating to any forensic analysis from this investigation. Fingerprints. Shoe analysis. Copy of any all jail phone calls made by Mr. Murdoch, in which the state tends to offer evidence from trial. The state has not notified the defense that it intends to offer any of these calls. Oh, and the polygraph test and charts uh, recordings for all polygraphs conducted from this investigation. Probably not admissible, but man, it makes for great courtroom drama. And defendants request underlying test data so that the expert witnesses can review the charts that indicate deception as to Curtis Smith, assess the degree of deception that is indicated. Audio and video recordings of Mr. Smith apparently haven't been turned over yet. Why not? How about Google search? Apparently, the state served a warrant on Google asking that they want to have all of these searches produced by Mr. Murdoch. Hey, where is that information? And how about those internal email documents between the uh, investigators? It's prime open for cross-examination, potentially exculpatory. And hey, how about some body-worn cameras from interviews of Debbie McMillan and Grant Kander? Where are these uh, documents? Where are these videos? Where are these expert reports? Ladies and gentlemen, I have said this before. Some of my best victories have been in homicide cases where we went on the first setting and we said, let's go. And guess what? If the prosecution doesn't turn this information over, and we got a very short amount of time before this goes to trial, guess what? They don't get to use it. So just another point. When the prosecution charges their case, they should literally be in the position to say, here you go. Here's everything that you have. This is just a good example of why when the prosecution charges a case, they need to be ready. Now, I understand there's some cases they you know, they trip over a body and they need to figure out who did it and arrest somebody. I get that. But when you wait a year to indict somebody, you better have all your ducks in a row so that you can turn over all the information, turn it over to the defense and say, we're ready if you want to go to trial within speedy trial limits. And if they can't do that, well, they maybe need to hold off charging somebody. And finally today, our dumb criminal. Please meet Matthew Letham. Now, he has a tattoo of the Sunshine State on his forehead, and he is facing a felony battery charge uh, after allegedly slicing up a friend with a razor. Now, a witness told police that Mr. Latham 
and a male victim engaged in a physical altercation after a verbal dispute over a cell phone. Now, during the 4.30 a.m. confrontation outside a gas station convenience store, the victim said that Mr. Latham used a razor to cut him on his neck and leg. A surveillance camera recorded Mr. Latham chasing the victim, who was seen holding a shirt to his neck to stop the bleeding uh, from the slice wound. The victim sustained several lacerations to his person, and according to the criminal complaint, which noted that the man was transported to the hospital where the injury to the neck required some staples. Ouch, pretty good slice. Now in the police interview, Mr. Latham reportedly copped to removing a razor blade from his pocket and cutting the victim, but claimed, hey, I was acting in self-defense. There were no visible injuries uh, to the defendant to support the claim. Well, obviously, because it worked, right? Obviously. Mr. Latham was charged with aggravated battery with a deadly weapon, which is a felony and booked in the Pasco County Jail. He was later released on a $10,000 bond. Now, clearly one of the things that the police have to prove is that um, identity, that Mr. Latham was the one that did it. And how are they gonna be able to prove it was Mr. Latham? I mean, we just can't rely upon these videos, right? Oh, maybe it's because of the tattoo on his forehead of the great state of Florida. Now I love Florida, but I wouldn't get it tattooed on my forehead or Colorado, or California, or Texas, or any other state, to be honest with you. So that's kind of dumb. And it certainly doesn't help when they have to prove identification. Do you see the man that committed a crime that night and sliced somebody? Yes, I do. Where is he? And how do you know that's the same man? He had the same Florida tattoo on his forehead? That's dumb. All right, thanks for watching. Hope you join us tonight, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Well, maybe 6.05. And we will have Lori Hellis as our guest live to talk about her jousting with the judge in the Lori Vallow-Chad Day Bell matter to open it up for all of us. Please join us.